Well, this whole quitting my job thing to do journalism has reaped some rewards. I had the privilege of spending 24 hours on the USS Dwight D. Eisenhower. The trip was really short notice, less than a week, so this isn't something I would have been able to do if I was still working for Accenture. The trip cost me about $1,000 between food, charging, and hotels. Believe it or not, I'm actually not a shill for the military industrial complex. The CIA does not pay me. I even had to pay $60 for meals and lodging while I was on the carrier. So thanks to all my Substack subscribers who pay me $5 a month so that I can do this kind of stuff. Now, I've often hesitated when covering naval stuff because I'm just not that familiar with it, and I've turned it into a joke calling the Navy the Department of the Boat People. And yes, this t-shirt is available on Bunker Branding, along with stickers and hoodies. Now, initially, I wanted to do a technical explanation of how things worked on the carrier, but I just didn't have the time to concentrate on one task, and I was in a press pool. So instead, I want to talk about the carrier from a fish out of water army perspective and also answer some of your questions about aircraft carrier life that you asked me to investigate. This whole adventure started when the Navy sent me an email and asked if I wanted to spend a few hours on an aircraft carrier and maybe do a video. And I was floored. The US Army invites me to places all the time, but when I've called the Navy, it's kind of been crickets. So the fact that they reached out to me made me feel like Sally Field accepting an Oscar. And I can't deny the fact that you like me right now. You like me. I drove down to Jacksonville Naval Air Station and I met up with the press pool. I met some pretty cool people, all of whom were real journalists. Tess Connell of iHeartMedia, Matt Haskell of uh, Skies Magazine, Nadia Rose of the Daytona Beach News Journal, Brent Lane of Cat Country 89.7, and Brent Kearney and Tristan Turner of Channel 3 WEAR-TV. And also Scott Bryan of the Tribune and Georgian, who is a fellow smoker. I was lucky enough to share a stateroom with him. Now, our PAO, or public affairs officer, accompanying us on this trip was Lieutenant Commander Dawn Stankus. Think of her as our VIP escort. She was also assisted by a number of other shipboard PAOs who were kind of like tour guides. Oftentimes we walked places, one PAO was in front and the other was in a rear, ducks in the row. We flew out to the carrier on a C-2 Greyhound, which has been the Navy's COD, or Carrier Onboard Delivery Aircraft, since 1964. This plane is also the base model of the E-2 Hawkeye AWACS radar plane. Note that the V-22 Osprey is slowly replacing the C-2 Greyhound, but right now that's only in the Pacific. Now, I don't actually have any footage from the takeoff and landing from inside the plane. I was told in no uncertain terms not to have anything in my hands during takeoff and landing for safety. It might seem like a strange rule, but I learned in my military career that when a crew chief or loadmaster tells you to do something, you should probably do that thing. The carrier landing was not as shocking as I expected, just a boom and a tug. I've been on Army Chinooks and Blackhawks that had rougher rides. I also knew that these pilots were so good that they probably weren't going to screw up, and if they did, I'd never feel it anyway, so why worry? When we landed, we were ushered into a sort of reception room with refreshments where we met the captain of the ship, Captain Chris Chowda Hill. He talked about the ship and we got a very sensible safety brief that essentially said, don't go anywhere that says restricted and don't climb any vertical ladders because they only go to restricted places. Easy rules. One of the things we were handed was this booklet called The Way of the Warrior Sailor. When a captain takes command of a ship, he traditionally publishes a command philosophy. It's typically a one-page memorandum. Captain Hill wrote a book. It's 26 pages, and they all support a mission and a vision. The mission is to launch and recover aircraft and stomp on bad guys. Seriously, that's what this book says. And the vision is to be the best damn ship in the Navy. Now, for my sample of well, one ship, I was pretty impressed. And I think it starts with how clean the ship was. I didn't see a single piece of trash on the floor. And I can contrast that with the Army, where I've been in some Humvees and Bradleys that look like they're from an episode of Hoarders. And in my weapons company, I try to enforce clean Humvees because all that loose crap can become secondary missiles if you get blown up. But on a ship, it seems like cleanliness is necessary because trash is a fire hazard, a trip hazard, and it also prevents pumps from being clogged if the ship gets flooded during an emergency. But there also seems to be a level of respect or reverence for the ship. You know, in the Army, pride tends to be focused on the unit. You're a rockasan, you're a ranger, you're airborne. And Marines have pride in the fact that they're Marines, no matter what unit they're in. But in the Navy, 
Pride seems to be focused on the ship. They have hats, they have jackets, and different divisions, which I, I guess would be a company in the army or a department in the civilian world, even have customized belt buckles. Some of these belt buckles are pretty damn funny, and it was a source of pride for these sailors to wear these belt buckles. And the US Army would never, ever, ever authorize something like this. The Army would allow soldiers to smoke pot while wearing a beard before they allowed soldiers to wear customized belt buckles for morale. And this pride in the ship even extends to the forecastle. Now, a forecastle traditionally means before the sail, and it used to be a place where the sailors slept or used as a storeroom. But on a carrier, the forecastle is a sacred place. It's where the anchor chains are stored, and it's where ceremonies and church services take place. The forecastle is so sacred that the bosun's mates of the Ike asked me not to take any pictures. And the reason is that they didn't think it looked good enough. Yeah, they were repainting some areas, and they didn't think it looked good enough to post online. That's the level of pride these sailors have in their ship. Now, I did find a picture of the forecastle on the USS Gerald R. Ford, so you can get an idea of, of what it looks like. These are the anchor chains, which they paint and keep in pristine condition. Now, you know how I mentioned bosun's mate a few seconds ago? I need to explain Navy ranks, because initially it was very confusing to me. In the Army, for enlisted men, you're a private, you're a specialist, you're a sergeant. And while there's different kinds of sergeants, you typically don't specify the type unless you're a first sergeant or sergeant major. The only time I ever really called myself Sergeant First Class Macbeth was when I was giving a class. My, my name is Sergeant First Class Macbeth. I'm going to give you a block of instruction on whatever. Now, Sergeant First Class was my rank, but my job, or MOS, known as a military occupational specialty, was 11 Hotel Anti-Armor Infantryman. And when the Army got rid of that, I became an 11 Bravo Infantryman. The Navy's equivalent of MOS is, is NEC, or Navy Enlisted Classification, but really they call them rates. And like everything in the Navy, rates go back to the Revolutionary War. So let's talk about bosun's mates. It's one of the oldest rates in the Navy, and a bosun's mate is a sailor the way an infantryman is a soldier. When you think of a sailor, that's a bosun's mate. Bosun's mates do all of the grunt work on a ship. They're responsible for mooring lines, small boats, painting, cleaning, navigation. I thought rangers like to tie knots. These guys take it to a different level. Now, when you address a sailor, it's typically a combination of their rate and their rank. So this sailor is a bosun's mate. And his rank is Petty Officer First Class, which is the Army equivalent of an E6 Staff Sergeant. So I would address him as BM1. While on the Ike, I worked with a woman who was a Mass Communication Specialist and a Petty Officer Second Class. So I addressed her as MC2. Now, the Navy is steeped in tradition. And part of that tradition is eating separately. Enlisted sailors eat separate from officers. The enlisted eat in the mess. Officers eat in the wardroom. This is way different than the Army, where you just grab a tray, sit down, eat your food, burp, and taste it later. And you could be sitting next to the battalion commander. It didn't matter. Now, now normally this doesn't happen unless the chow hall is totally full, but it's pretty common for a platoon leader and his platoon sergeant to sit down together for a meal and talk about the upcoming field exercise or whatever. And I tried to figure out why this Navy tradition developed, and I kind of came to the conclusion that nobody really knows why. But in the age of sail, the captain was master and commander of his ship, and he would give out punishments while at sea. It wasn't until 1862 that flogging was eliminated as a punishment, and it wasn't until 2019 that being confined to the brig with only bread and water was eliminated, although it wasn't commonly used as a punishment. So I guess the Navy has to have this stratification between enlisted and officers because you're on a freaking ship in the middle of the ocean. And if someone doesn't do their job or falls asleep on watch, it could kill everybody on the ship. So officers had to remain apart from enlisted men so they wouldn't become too friendly with the sailors because they might have to discipline them later with a whip. Now, there's even stratification among the enlisted men. In the Navy, the Navy chief is anyone above the rank of E7. Chief, senior chief, master chief. So the army equivalent to that would be sergeant first class, master sergeant, and sergeant major. Now, in the Army, a Sergeant First Class is a tactically and technically proficient guy, but you're a generalist. By the time you make chief in the Navy, you are an expert at whatever rate you have and possess extensive knowledge on how a ship is supposed to run. So when you become a chief, there's an entire pinning ceremony. In the Army, when you become an E7, you get a pat on the back and you're told you have staff duty on the next three-day weekend. And this veneration earns the chiefs the right to have their own mess, which they call the goat locker.
Many people say that the goat locker is the best food on the ship. And incidentally, goat locker goes back to the age of sail. Chiefs were responsible for caring for the livestock on the ship, usually goats, but chickens as well, since they provided fresh milk, meat, and eggs. Now, while on the carrier, I was granted access to pretty much wherever I wanted to go within reason. They're not letting me near the reactors, and that stuff is super classified anyway. But I tried to talk to people who didn't get mentioned much in the movies. So bosun's mates, aviation ordnance men, uh, culinary specialists, master at arms, which is kind of like a Navy policeman. But of course, I went up on the flight deck. That's got to be the most dangerous place on Earth. Everything on that ship is trying to kill you. The planes have these antennas and tubes that can poke you in the eye. They're tied down with chains that you can trip over. Engines are roaring. The heat is like standing next to a pizza oven. When a plane launches and then another plane launches on the opposite side just a few feet from you, you can really recognize your mortality. It's an easy place to get hurt. And I think the only reason why anybody on that flight deck is still alive is that the Navy has this incredible safety program where you have to get qualified to even go up on deck. I'm not gonna call it chaos. I'm sure it was very well orchestrated and the sailors on the flight deck just made it look easy. But it was like watching a ballet dancer spin between chainsaws. This is hard, industrial, backbreaking work. People call an aircraft carrier a floating city. It's not. It's more like a floating factory with all of the inherent dangers of industrial work. And the factory produces consequences for America's adversaries. America has 11 aircraft carriers. Most countries don't even have a single aircraft carrier. And the air wing of a carrier is larger than the air forces of most countries. They can fit up to 90 planes and helicopters on this thing. And most pilots fly at least once every two days or so. They need it because landing on carriers is hard and you need to maintain proficiency. A couple of other things I noticed about the ship. They had a Starbucks, but it wasn't a Starbucks. The sailors manning the coffee shop were CSs or culinary specialists that were sent to barista training, but it wasn't always Starbucks coffee. Sometimes it was Dunkin' Donuts or whatever they could get. The food was good. I was only able to eat in the wardroom in the chief's mess. I wanted to eat in the enlisted mess, but I could kind of read the room. Uh, splitting off to eat with the enlisted meant that one of the PAOs would have to come with me, and then I'm away from the group, and I kind of know how far I can push it. I'm a guest, and I don't want to walk into someone's house and tell them what's what. But that being said, the food was good. I actually ate something they call hamster, which is what they call chicken cordon bleu in the army. The weirdest part was how casual the meal was. Your typical army platoon sergeant meal is to stuff as much food in your mouth as possible before the first sergeant calls you because you need to get him a list of all the lists you've made since you started making lists. And by the way, the commander needs a master list by 1300. And I, I asked the executive officer of the Ike why everybody was eating so slowly. And he said that they like to encourage people to take lunch because it might be their only break. I know, I know. There's some army major in the S3 shop who hates his family and is laughing right now. The other thing I found interesting was this, that the ship had Wi-Fi through Starlink. Now, the Wi-Fi wasn't super fast. You aren't watching Netflix or FaceTiming with your family. But it's good enough for a text message or a small email with maybe one attachment, like a picture of your kid. And the Wi-Fi had a noticeable positive effect on morale. When we left the ship, it was a catapult takeoff on a C2 Greyhound. The launch was really no different than being on a roller coaster, and it only lasted two seconds. It was violent, but it was manageable. Now, while I was on the ship, the PAO of the ship asked me not to post on social media, and I respected that. And that's when I kind of realized that we were being watched. I actually asked the executive officer and the command master chief, who again is like the ship command sergeant major, whether our adversaries were following us. And the XO said he didn't know anything about that, which was a good political answer. But the command master chief said something a little different. He said that the location of strategic assets like an aircraft carrier is always of interest to our adversaries. Again, a diplomatic answer, but that's the first time I ever felt like it was personal. You know, when I did heavy weapons in Iraq, I was, there was never a bullet with my name on it. You were on the road or at a forward operating base, a mortar or an IED wasn't personal. It was more like to whom it may concern. But the carrier, that's personal. Our adversaries would love to sink a carrier. Now this particular carrier was surrounded by four destroyers and an Italian frigate. So we were pretty well protected. And by the way, it's common for uh, us to work with other NATO navies since everybody gets to learn best practices. 
But the People's Liberation Army rocket force considered American aircraft carriers so deadly that they built their latest missile, the DF-21D, specifically as a carrier killer. You know you're doing something right when some adversary invents a weapon just for you. One final thing. Whenever I do videos, I always get a certain group of people in the comments section to talk about how soft the military is now. I didn't see any of that. I just saw people dragging chains and busting their butts to turn around jets for the next flight. While I was there, the ship had a Pride Night celebration, although I suspected most of the people there really just wanted cake and an excuse to break the monotony of shipboard life. One of the commander's tenets in his book was about diversity. I'd like to read that to you because it really resonated with me, especially for someone like me who never really fit into a neat box as an Irish Protestant in America. One of the things I love most about America is that we're crazy diverse. I think it's beautiful. We have people on this ship from dozens of countries, from distinct cultures who speak a ton of different languages and dialects. It doesn't matter where you're from, what skin color you have, what your sexual identity or preference is. You are forged together as one crazy family of brothers and sisters in arms. Our enemies have nothing like this. They don't even promote diversity of thought. With a team like we have today on the ship, how can we possibly lose? So the next time you think America's Navy is too woke or too focused on pronouns, I invite you to enlist at Navy.com and go turn a jet like the men and women of the best damn ship in the Navy. Thank you for watching. And thank you, USS Dwight D. Eisenhower, for having me. Oh, hi, America. It's me, Elon. Uh, if you want to be cool like me, go and get a Ryan McBeth t-shirt or hoodie from Bunker Branding. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get a high mouse shirt because it fires rockets, and rockets are pretty cool, just like me. Ha 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 ha, you fool. It is me, Mark Zuckerberg, from Facebook, and I will be the coolest once I get a Patriot shirt because the system is fully automated, just like me. <laughs> I'm going to get a U.S. Navy Department of the Boat People hoodie because I love their management style. Now, I will be cooler than any of you lads once I get my drone sweet drone shirt. Now, I'm going to get a landmine marker shirt because they blow up just like windows. Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to get. Oh, no. It is Steve Wozniak from uh, Apple. That's right, you nerds. You think you're the coolest for wearing a shirt? Well, Ryan McBeth is all the work, yeah. So go buy a shirt from Bunker Branding to fund Ryan McBeth to increase your understanding. Oh, yeah!